And that's sort of like what we want to preach about, the voice of many waters. And last weekend, I talked a bit about the river. And, uh, and I thought of something. I saw something while we were into that lesson. And something it, hit me last week. And, and I said, I need to get into this some more. So in Ezekiel chapter 10, remember we talked about the glory of the Lord? And if you go to chapter 1, what did that glory look like? He only refers to it as the glory of the Lord after chapter 1 because chapter 1 had such a long explanation of what that glory looked like that he couldn't do that every time he talked about it. So he said, this is the glory of the Lord. And, and, and then when you read on, that's what he's referring to. But remember, there was a throne made of, what is this, sapphire? And, and sapphire pavement and Jesus was on that throne he was gold from his waist up, fire from his waist down. And that's what Revelation said Jesus looked like. Gold around the paps and legs like fire. Ezekiel saw Jesus way back in Ezekiel chapter 1. And he said there was a rainbow around him. And on that throne there was the cherubim, the lion, the ox, the eagle, and the man were underneath it. Just like they were upholding that throne. And there was the wheel within the wheel. And some nutcase said that was a UFO. <laughs> And uh, he, he said, that's the glory of the Lord. And, and he said, that glory left the temple. And here's the first place that the glory went to when it was leaving the temple in the Old Testament Israel. And again, when it says in verse 4 of Ezekiel 10, the glory of the Lord, you've got to keep in mind chapter 1, a picture of Jesus sitting on the throne. So it says the cherubim or the cherubim stood on the right side of the house. Everybody say the temple. Yeah. When the man went in and the cloud filled the inner court, then the glory of the Lord went up from the cherub, stood over the threshold of the house. Everybody say the gate of the temple. The threshold is the doorway, right? And, and it's a gate. So the glory is leaving the temple. This vision that he saw of Jesus on the throne was leaving and it stopped at the gate. And the house was filled with the cloud and the court was full of the brightness of the Lord's glory. Then in chapter 11, before he leaves that gate of the temple, we read something that sounds like New Testament language. Chapter 11, verse 17. Therefore say, thus saith the Lord, God, I will even gather you from the people and assemble you out of the countries where you have been scattered and I will give you the land of Israel. And let me pause there for a moment, give you a little bit of background. I can't read the whole chapter. But just before he said this about Israel, he's going to bring them from all the countries, give them their land. He had rebuked Israel and rebuked and scolded them so severely and a man actually died when Ezekiel was prophesying this. A man named Pelatiah, the son of Benaiah, died and fell dead when Ezekiel was prophesying. Reminds me of Peter saying, Ananias and Sapphira, you lied to the Holy Ghost. Boom, they fell down dead. And then after this man dies, Ezekiel starts crying out, God, there's not going to be any Jews and any Israelites left if you destroy them like this. Have mercy, have mercy. And then God starts speaking. Don't you worry, I got it all in control. There's always going to be a remnant of Israel. There's always going to be people in Israel that know and believe me. How many know the first people that ever got saved on the day of Pentecost were Jews? First ones were Jews. And everybody say the remnant. The remnant. And Paul, he's talking about how Israel left God. And, and he's talking about how they need to come back. And he said, but I'm a Jew. I'm a Jew. God's got us. He still has a remnant. And you know, when people think all the Jews are ever going to be wiped out, you never have to worry about that. God's always going to have a remnant. Praise God. A seed is always going to be there. And it'll multiply again. And so that's what he starts talking like after this man is killed. And Ezekiel cries out to God, what are you doing? Then he says, don't worry. I'm going to bring them all back, even from all the countries that they were scattered. And they'll come thither. They shall take away all the detestable things thereof and all the abominations thereof from thence. In other words, I have to leave here, Ezekiel. Israel and Jerusalem has become so wicked and ungodly. And if you read Ezekiel, he talks about people worshiping 
images of bugs and insects on the wall of the temple and, and I have to leave but when I come back all these detestable things and abominations are going to be gone and then he talks New Testament talk watch this see if you remember reading this anywhere in the New Testament because I'm going to show you where it is I will give them one heart and I will put a new spirit within you and I will take the stony heart out of their flesh and will give them a heart of flesh that they may walk in my statutes keep mine ordinances and do them and they shall be my people and I will be their God praise God now I've done a lot of study on the Old Testament transitioning into the new I've done a lot of study about how a new covenant would be given to us and when I read the words of Ezekiel 10 and 20 that when God gives them this new heart gives them this new spirit that they will be his people and he will be their God immediately my mind went to Jeremiah 31 because I've used this verse a lot somebody say God foretold the coming of the New Testament watch this Jeremiah 31 and 31 behold the days come saith the Lord that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah everybody say the New Testament not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt remember when God gave them the old covenant when he brought them out of Egypt the Ten Commandments the law at Mount Sinai he says I'm gonna give them a new one but it's not gonna be like the one I gave them when they came out of Egypt why because he said which my covenant they break they broke it how many remember what happened when Moses came down with the Ten Commandments freshly made by the finger of God and what did he have to do with those tables after he saw what was going on he saw them worshiping a golden calf they had broken the first commandment before they even got them about worshiping one God and he took those tables and smashed them and he had to go back up for another 40 days and nights and God said I'm not writing it this time Moses you're writing it this time and Moses had to write it out the second time did you ever notice that God did it the first time with the finger of God but Moses had to do it himself the second time they broke the law before they even got it <laughs> so he says I'm not gonna give them a covenant like that because they broke it although I was a husband to them saith the Lord did you notice God called Israel his wife what's the church the bride huh? but this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days saith the Lord I will put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts and will be their God and they shall be my people now isn't that exactly what he said to Ezekiel he said I gotta leave them they're a mess they got the abomination detestable things and when I come back that's gonna be gone and I will give them my spirit and I will be their God and they shall be my people I declare to you he was foretelling the New Testament because when Ezekiel saw that glory what did I say he said the glory was in chapter 1 Jesus on the throne everybody say Jesus on the throne how many know when he ascended up into heaven he went to the throne it's the new covenant the whole new covenant I haven't even thought of this when God was giving me this message earlier but the whole new covenant started when he went into heaven sat on that right hand throne and poured out his spirit praise God and the day of Pentecost was when the church was born new creatures they were just disciples and they were just apostles and they were following Jesus but he said go to Jerusalem and wait for the promise of the Father because not many days hence you're gonna be baptized with the Holy Ghost and he said you'll receive power when the Holy Ghost comes upon you and they were made new creatures as the Spirit of God filled them and that's what he told Jeremiah I'm gonna put my spirit in them I'm not going to have laws written on stone. I'm going to put it in them and write it on their hearts. And they shall no more teach every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me. They just will all know me. For they. 
From the least of them to the greatest of them, saith the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity and I will remember their sin no more. Now, I don't have time to do it right now, but if you were to go to Hebrews 8, at the last few verses, Hebrews quotes what I just read. A new covenant, I'm going to put my law, they couldn't continue in it. The way Hebrews rephrases it, because it's like new, using another translation of the Bible, Hebrews says they couldn't continue in it. In Jeremiah, it says they broke it, the old covenant. So he says, I need to get a new. Now, listen to this. See if you can follow this. If, Mo, if God said the old covenant is not going to be repeated because they couldn't continue in it, they kept breaking it, so I'm giving them a new one where I'll put my law in their hearts. I'll put my spirit in them. Obviously, putting his law in our hearts and putting his spirit in us will help us not break it. Because if that's the difference between the one they kept breaking and he says, this is what I'm going to do instead, then obviously that's going to solve the problem. Aren't you glad for the power of the Holy Spirit? Oh, let's praise God for the power of the Holy Ghost. Thank you, Lord. God was comparing the old covenant with the new in Jeremiah. He was even doing it in Ezekiel 10 when the glory, or Ezekiel 11, when the glory was going to leave. And the reason he said, and he, oh my, this is just flowing now. The reason he said they're going to clean out all those detestable things, all those abominations before the glory was still at the gate and left is because when you put it together with Jeremiah 31, Ezekiel 11 and Jeremiah 31, both of them said, then I'll be their God. Then they'll be my people. It's because God's Spirit is going to clean out these detestable things from our lives. God's Spirit's going to take out all the abominations. We need the power of the Spirit in us. It needs to wash us. It needs to cleanse us. And when we can call on Him, when we're in trouble, the Spirit's right there. And we can be healed like we were talking about here. God can give you revelations. You find that your conversations go right in line with events that happen moments later. Like Paul, or Glenn was just saying. And so God was comparing the old covenant from Mount Sinai with a new covenant, putting his laws in our hearts. Everybody say, we have a better covenant. We have a better covenant. <laughs> Paul said the same thing in 2 Corinthians 3. Look at what we read in Ezekiel 11, Jeremiah 31, and compare it with what Paul said. I told you that you were talking New Testament language. Here's what proves it. 2 Corinthians 3 and 3. For as much as you are manifestly declared to be the epistle of Christ, ministered by us, not written with ink, but with the spirit of the living God, not in tables of stone. Somebody say Ten Commandments. Ten Commandments. There's where God's law was written in the Old Covenant, on tables of stone. But I'm not doing a covenant like that now. I'm going to bring you a new covenant. And this new covenant isn't going to be on tables of stone. It's going to be in fleshy tables of the heart. Praise God. And then chapter 3 verse 6, three verses later, he talks about him and the other apostles who also hath made us able ministers of the New Testament. Not of the letter. Somebody say the Old Testament. But of the Spirit. Because the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. But if the ministration of death, written and engraven in stone, say the Old Covenant, the Ten Commandments, it's actually calling the Ten Commandments a ministry of death. Because the letter kills. Because if all God says to you is, thou shalt not do this, and don't do that, and do this, and don't do that, but he doesn't give you the spirit to be able to do those things or not do those things, how many know you're not going to be able to do them or not do them? And if the soul that sins, it shall surely die. So it was a ministry of death. By the way, oh my, this is awesome. Does anybody remember, you know how Jesus died on the Passover day and he resurrected on the day of first fruits and Pentecost does anybody know what happened on the day of Pentecost in the Old Testament uh, it was something to do with harvest but that's not what I'm talking about there's something that happened at Pentecost now stop I'll give you a hint East Passover was in Egypt right when they put the blood of the lamb around the doors 
and God said I'll pass over the door and I won't allow that destroyer to come into you that was when Jesus died on the cross they left Egypt after the Passover and went into the wilderness and then went to Mount Sinai take the resurrection Easter weekend and just a few months later when the next big event happened the day of Pentecost do you know what happened on the day of Pentecost during the Exodus before they even celebrated they were just getting the laws actually to have Pentecost to have all these feasts and all these laws anybody just happen to know it I mean it, it's a hard question it is a hard one but does anybody happen to know the day Moses came down with the law written on stone oh man the more I think of it this comes together when they were worshiping a golden calf and he had to break the tables of stone he said everyone on the Lord's side come to me and you imagine there's been a lot of attacks against preachers in the last several years people disrespect I mean a hundred years ago never used to be like that but granted there's been preachers that have committed adultery been blasted all over the newspapers I mean sin needs to be exposed but it's like they just drowned the baby with the bathwater they threw it all out and didn't realize there's still some good people <laughs> I mean but the world is so critical now where even Christians are critical my when we first started our church in Portage you wouldn't believe the suspicious people I, that didn't trust me because another preacher had hurt them so bad they even got to the point where they said Mike we know you didn't do anything but we can't trust you they said what <laughs> what have you lost all hope in any preacher in church and now have you gone that far how many know where sin abounds grace is much more abound there's still true people of God and there's a lot of hypocrite Christians sitting on church pews but there's a lot of good sincere Christians too amen and so anyway they came to Moses if they were on God's side people wouldn't do that today <laughs> but anyway they did he said you want to be on God's side come to me and the Levites were the only ones that came out from a, the golden calf and then Moses said okay everyone you take a sword I want you to slay your brother, your neighbor, your friend, I don't care who it is, slay those idolaters. And does anybody know how many people were killed that day? 3,000 people. It distinctly says it, 3,000 people. Look in Exodus, you'll find it. The day of Pentecost, the Spirit came and God wrote His laws in their hearts just like Paul said I'm not doing the new one on stone anymore I'm doing it in your hearts and after the cross after the resurrection God's Spirit came down on the day of Pentecost and 3,000 people were saved where that same day 1500 years earlier 3,000 people were killed the law is death but the Spirit gives life and the New Testament gospel is an emphasis on the Holy Spirit the Holy Ghost because Jesus is on the throne and shed forth the power of the Holy Ghost Peter said you see all these people talking in languages that you can't see how they can being uneducated Galileans well this is what Joel talked about Jesus went to the throne and poured out his spirit and filled them with the power of the Holy Ghost that's what you're seeing hallelujah and those people were so changed Peter who was such a coward and lied and cursed three times because he couldn't stand for Jesus after saying he'd die for Jesus looked into the face of those men of Jerusalem and said you crucified the Lord of glory he never would have done that without the power of the Holy Spirit not in a million years would he have done that but he turned into a lion when the Holy Ghost got a hold of him hallelujah my dad said you'll never preach you're too shy to get in front of people oh boy not with the Holy Ghost in me I could have a thousand don't bother me in fact the more there are the easier it is to preach yeah. hallelujah and so that happened 3,000 died the day the law came but 3,000 were saved the day the Spirit came yeah. and it's not a ministration of the letter it's a ministration of the Spirit life 
And so we're not ministers of the letter. We're ministers of the spirit because the letter kills 3,000 of them that day, but the spirit gives life. 3,000 were born again that day. Hallelujah. So he says the old covenant is a ministration of death. So can you see where he is comparing the Old Testament with the New? Just like Jeremiah did. I'm not going to give you a covenant like you got when you came out of Egypt. I'm going to give you a new covenant. Oh my. And so you start reading New Testament references when Ezekiel is seeing the glory leave Israel. How many know John chapter 1? says he came to his own but what? His own received him not. But to many as did receive him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. Somebody say the Holy Ghost. Holy Ghost. And so Jesus is that glory that Ezekiel saw. In fact, John 1 and 14 also says, The word was made flesh, dwelt among us. We beheld his glory, the glory. Ezekiel saw the glory getting ready to leave. Jesus is the glory. Didn't Ezekiel see Jesus sitting on a throne in chapter 1? And he said, this is the glory of the Lord. And so when we go to chapter 10, we go to chapter 11, and the glory is leaving, he's talking about Jesus. And he actually calls Jesus the glory in John chapter 1. In the same chapter, his own people didn't receive him. See, it's like you see this thing back and forth old and new. Israel rejecting him and God coming again with another people including the remnant. And then look where that glory goes in Ezekiel 11 and 23. Where's the last stop that it made at the temple when chapter 10 occurred? Remember I said it stayed there before it left? The gate, the threshold, remember? He didn't just go boom, I'm out of here. <laughs> he just went to the gate. And then Ezekiel started prophesying and people are dying and Ezekiel's crying and he says, God, what are you doing? And don't worry, Ezekiel, I'm going to clean up this mess and I'm coming back. So he stopped at the gate. And then after he talks about the New Testament, putting my spirit in you, then you'll be my people and then I'll be your God when we get that mess cleared up. The glory of the Lord went up from the midst of the city. He sees it. Jesus is on that throne, gold and fire. He sees that glory go up from the temple, comes away from the gate of the east that stood there for so long, and stood upon the mountain which is on the east side of the city. And what did I tell you that mountain was last week? When you look on a map, you see Jerusalem, look right to the east, there's a certain mountain there, the Mount of Olives. Everybody say the Mount of Olives. So it's going in increments. He leaves the holiest of holies and goes to the gate. He prophesies, people die, but I'm going to clean this up and come back. And there's going to be another covenant this time. And then he goes to the mountain of olives. Jesus, now I made a mistake here. Jesus was not on the mountain yet when he wept over Jerusalem. But it was just a verse or two before he went to Jerusalem that he wept. Or I mean went to the mount of olives rather. See, look in Matthew 23 and 34. If you read all of Ezekiel 10 and all of Ezekiel 11, where the glory is getting out of there, he's rebuking, he's hammering Jerusalem. Just like Jesus was hammering Jerusalem when he was at the temple. Watch this. Wherefore, behold, I send unto you prophets and wise men and scribes. Some of them you'll kill and you'll crucify. Some of them you'll scourge in your synagogue. And all you have to do is read the book of Acts to hear about them persecuting them from city to city that upon you may come all the righteous blood shed on the earth from the blood of righteous Abel to the blood of Zacharias now never before was any group of people ever guilty of that you mean before Israel even existed before Noah was in the ark before long before when, when Abel was killed Every murder since then was coming on the shoulders of Jerusalem. I mean, that was unbelievable. And if you go a little earlier, he says, you guys are going to fill the cup of your fathers. You admit that you're the children of your fathers which persecuted the prophets. You're going to fill their cup. In other words, the wickedness they were doing, you're taking it to the brim. 
And all the guilt since Abel died right until Zechariah is going on your shoulders, Jerusalem. Everybody say, this generation. <laughs> say, this generation. <laughs> all these things shall come upon this generation. What? All the blood that was ever shed. All of those unrighteous murders. All of that guilt was coming on Jerusalem. That generation in Jesus' day. And then that's where he breaks down and cries. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. Thou that killest the prophets and stones them which are sent unto thee, how often would I have gathered thy children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, and you would not. Behold, your house is left unto you desolate. And watch this. Keep reading in chapter 24. And Jesus went out and look, departed from the temple. Say it with me. Departed from the temple. He was at the temple. The glory of the Lord was at the temple in Ezekiel 10. And Ezekiel 11. And God was hammering Jerusalem for their wickedness. Just like Jesus was at the temple. And he is the glory. That glory Ezekiel saw. That represents Jesus the glory. And he's hammering Jerusalem. He's ham and he's at the temple when he does it. And then he leaves the temple. And his disciples came to him to show him the buildings of the temple. I mean they're about spinning dizzy. Did you just hear John what Jesus said? He said, I never read that anywhere in all the prophets. All the guilt from Abel's death till Zechariah is coming on this city in our generation. And then he cried and he cried and he didn't want to say it, but he had to say it. Did you just hear what he said? And so no wonder they show him the buildings of the temple. And in verse 3, as he sat where? On the very same Mount of Olives that the glory went to in Ezekiel when it left the temple. When he was slamming Jerusalem, slamming Israel because of the unclean temple. Jesus goes to that very same Mount of Olives. And that's when the disciples came to him privately saying, tell us when shall all these things be? When, when is this going to happen? When is all this blood guilt going to come on them? When is this house going to be left desolate? Jesus, we're kind of concerned because we're alive right now. I mean, we'd kind of like to know when you're going to do this. And what shall be the sign of thy coming and the end of the world? And you know, the end of the world there is not what most people think. If you look in the Greek, it's the end of the age. Yes. An age was coming to an end. The age of the law. The age of the letter, the age of the Ten Commandments, the age of the temple. No wonder he says that not one stone of that temple is going to be left standing on another. Because how long is a generation in the Bible? Does anybody happen to know? 40 years. Jesus died what year? 33. What's 40 plus 33? 73. Does anybody know what happened in Jerusalem in 70 A.D.? It was wiped out to the ground by the Romans after Jesus said, when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, head to the hills. Get out of there. And while I was talking about this last Sunday, Elton Bear came up to me and said, they went to Pella. I said, that's exactly where they went. They went to Pella and not one Christian died in that siege because they remembered what Jesus said. When you see Jerusalem and surrounded with armies, go to the hills. And Pella was in the hills. And all the Jews in the city were either killed, were either taken prisoner, or starved to death. I, I watched a movie, Masada, years ago. Anybody ever seen Masada? It was Herod's fortress in Jerusalem on the mountain. And when the Romans came in, they besieged. And way back when God started opening these things up to me, I looked on the back of this video, said for over three years they were kept themselves in there and starved themselves to death. And then when finally the Romans broke through, it even showed in the movie, the Roman general just went, fell on his knees crying because they all had committed suicide rather than be taken by the Romans. It's called Masada. It'll break your heart. But not one Christian perished. Not one Christian perished. And it was exactly the Mount of Olives where all of this happened. And you know, I'm going to... I. Got a lot more here. Candace always says to me, she can follow how many pages I am in my screens. I'm on the 20th screen. I got 68 of them. <laughs> so I'm not even a third through. I'm about a third through right now. 
So I'm not going to worry. We're not going to be here all day to go to page 68. But I do want to show you this. That if you go to Ezekiel 1. Is that Bible nearby? If you go to Ezekiel 1 for a minute. Oh, hallelujah. Somebody say, the day of Pentecost was coming. After the resurrection. The day of Pentecost was coming. If you go to Ezekiel chapter 1. Where I told you the glory wheel within a wheel. Jesus, gold and fire. Lion, the ox, the eagle, and the man. All of that was what he called the glory of the Lord that you read about that left that temple. It said that their voice had a certain sound. The sound of many waters. Praise God. Verse 24 of Ezekiel 1. And when they went, talking about the lion, the ox, the eagle, the throne, Jesus on it, the wheel within the wheel. When they went, I heard the noise of their wings like the noise of great waters. As the voice of the Almighty, the voice of speech, as the noise of a host, when they stood, they let down their wings. In chapter 1, everybody say, the glory, the glory. sounded like many waters. And then when you go to the second last chapter in Ezekiel chapter 47, and you read in chapter 47, verse 1, Afterward he brought me again to the door of the house. Remember that was where the glory left. And behold, waters issued out from under the threshold of the house eastward. The forefront of the house stood toward the east. Waters came down from under the right side of the house at the south side. And he said, Ezekiel, walk into the water. And he went to his ankles, remember that? Then he went to his knees and then he went to his loins. And then he was swimming in it. Isn't it coincidence that chapter 1 says his voice sounded like many waters. And when you get to the end of the book, there's waters pouring out of the temple. And then the Lord spoke to me and said, look at Revelation chapter 1. And so when you go to Revelation chapter 1, and you see Jesus with gold and fire, just like Ezekiel saw him. It says in verse... 15, his feet like unto fine brass as if they burned in a furnace and his voice as the sound of many waters. And then when you go to the last chapter of Revelation, just like the end of Ezekiel, Ezekiel had him talking like many waters, the cherubims and the whole scene that Ezekiel saw. And then Ezekiel 47, rivers of water are pouring out of that temple. In Revelation 22, he showed me a pure river of water, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. And waters are pouring out of the new Jerusalem. Somebody say the new Jerusalem. The new Jerusalem. This isn't the old one. This is a new one. This isn't the old covenant. It's a new one. This isn't the old temple. It's the new temple of the Holy Ghost. And then the Lord spoke to me because I, it's like he asked me, now, what do you think it means to have a voice like many waters and then to read about waters just pouring out later? And I thought about what Peter said on the day of Pentecost. Jesus went to the throne and poured this out. Jesus shed this forth. And remember the woman at the well. He said, woman, give me something to drink. And she said, I'm a Samaritan, why would you ask me? He said, you're not only a Samaritan, you've had five husbands and the one you're with isn't your own. He said, if you'd ask me for water, I'd give you water where you'd never thirst again. Praise God. And then John chapter 7, the last day of the feast, the great day of the feast, John 7 and 37. Jesus cried with a loud voice. On the very day of the feast, when the, somebody in Jerusalem would take a pot and pour water out, Jesus is screaming at the top of his lungs over in the city. If any man thirst, let him come unto me. And out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. And then John adds in brackets, but this spake he of the Holy Ghost. For the Holy Ghost was not yet given because Jesus was not yet glorified. You know what the voice of many waters is? It's the voice of the Lord talking about the new covenant because waters are going to pour when you hear somebody have a voice like many waters. You know what you folks were doing? Every one of you this morning 
When you were talking about the Spirit doing this and doing that, I was hearing a voice of many waters. I was hearing a voice of many waters. Woo. You start talking about God. You start talking about what the Holy Spirit does. There's going to be a sound of abundance of rain. There's going to be a voice of many waters, and it's going to pour, and it's going to pour. And all this sermon has been a voice of many waters. That's everything I preach today. I can best describe it with a voice of many waters. That's what he sounded like when Ezekiel first saw it, and then the waters were pouring by the time you get to the end. That's what John saw in Revelation when he first saw Jesus, and then waters were pouring out of the city by the end of the Revelation. Talk about the things of the Spirit. Talk about God moving. Talk about God working through you by His Spirit. Because isn't that what He made these bodies for? Out of our bellies shall flow rivers of living water. There is a river. It makes glad the city of God. Hallelujah, Jesus. Aren't you glad there's a river this morning? Let's all stand together right now. Hallelujah. Oh, I wish I could have gone on longer. Cause wait till you hear.